Kira and welcome back after the break, everybody. Um, so my very great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, who is uh, Lisa Ward. Um, Lisa has Im immense experience over a number of years working mainly in, in Victoria, in Australia. Um, at one point, she actually managed the, the youth justice system over there and um, has also experience in, in both uh, care and protection uh, work with children and in the correction space. So a whole gamut of experience. Um, she's held statutory appointments uh, on the uh, Child Death uh, Investigation Committee, has also been on the parole board and offered advice to the Victorian government on things like um, sentencing review and sentencing advisory committees. Um, Having, having spoken to, to Lisa in the in the preparation for the conference, it's become clear to me that um, she's passionate about joining up uh, youth justice agencies um, with social care agencies to make sure that complex problems get simple solutions across government and that we must listen to the evidence led voice of the people who've experienced the problems themselves, understanding the communities and where they where they live and the problems they experience. So someone who's uh, got a rich vein of experience, I'm sure you'll enjoy the keynote presentation. So thank you for agreeing to present, Lisa. Kira. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for those kind words. Uh, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands on which we're meeting today. For me, it's the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. The land on which I stand today always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd also like to pay my respects and acknowledge the Tangata Whenua of Aotearoa, Nanihi Kiakoto. Good afternoon, everyone. As someone coming to you from Melbourne, uh, the world's most locked down city. I would so like to be doing this in person today. But here we are in this brave new world. It's a credit to the conference organisers that they've been able to get this show on the road. The technology appears to be working. So let's make the most of it. This presentation this afternoon is an emphatic endorsement of bringing the evidence to bear in youth justice. But it's also about how we communicate the evidence how we communicate what we know to be true. All of us in YJ are aware of that uh, evidence policy gap, that frustrating experience of knowing what good uh, processes and policies look like for young people, but seeing policy decisions that are counter to this. All too often, a response to the evidence policy gap is to lament the lack of evidence and to call for more. I was at a parliamentary inquiry recently where one politician after another uh, urged us to do more research. There was a constant refrain that we needed more evidence. My thesis is that we know a lot already, but that we need to draw it together, to package it up and to present it clearly and coherently to decision makers, especially to decision makers who don't know that much about youth justice. Of course, being able to distill and communicate our guiding principles won't inoculate us against poor policy decisions. That's because uh, criminal justice policy takes place in a hotly contested space. At the end of the day, it must take account of emotion and, and the emotion that people feel in the face of wrongdoing. And it must sway and move in accordance with shifts in public sentiment over time. Uh, years of penal populism have taught us this, if nothing else. For this reason, we're unlikely to win the hearts and minds of the public by relying solely on the evidence. We need to factor in the role of emotion in our public communications. And I'll come back to this point a little later on. However, the hearts and minds of the bureaucracies who support our elected officials especially the central agencies of Treasury and Finance, are a different thing altogether. These groups still aspire to an evidence-based approach that factors in the uh, importance of effectiveness and value for money. We must be ready for this uh, and present the central tenets of what we do in YJ 
coherently and clearly. Now, again, I'm not naive enough to think that policy making is a purely rational process or that there's a direct linear connection between the evidence and the policy outcomes. Excuse me just a moment. I'm just going to see if I can sharpen the focus on my camera. Okay. Um, as I was saying, um, we uh, policy making isn't rational. We know that. We know it's messy. We know it's complicated. Um, if I can adapt a famous quote, uh, policies are like sausages. It's best not to see them made. And like many of you, uh, I'm sure I've certainly seen some pretty awful policies made over the years. Nevertheless, um, there are plenty of examples where evidence and reason have prevailed, especially when they, when they align with good economic arguments. And often they do align with really good economic arguments in the criminal justice space. And that's good for us. The justice reinvestment uh, movement internationally is the poster child for this proposition, that we can get good evidence-based um, arguments across the line. Closer to home, uh, we've seen New Zealand sign on to a bipartisan justice reform agenda that is deeply evidence-led. While the move to raise the age of criminal responsibility is gaining what I think is inevitable momentum across many jurisdictions in this room today. One of the more interesting and contentious thinkers around at the moment is Harvard psychologist uh, Steven Pinker. I'm not sure if you've come across his work. He wrote a book a few years ago that presented a forensic case for why the world is now a less violent and much safer place than it's ever been in, at any point in history. But despite this, why there's still a general perception that the world is more violent than it's ever been. In his most recent work, he argues that holders of progressive liberal views who value science and reason need to be loud and proud in defending this perspective. He catalogues a range of forces that are anti-science, that are anti-knowledge, and cautions that there's no place for complacency in promoting the evidence and the things that we know to be true. He draws particular attention to the tendency for certain truths to become so agreed, so accepted, that we stop calling them out until they're not so agreed and they're not so accepted and they start entering the territory of the contested. This message is really relevant to all of us in youth justice. And it highlights why we need to be clear about the things we hold true and why we do them. It was partly this thinking that led me to try to distill the key elements of youth justice into a concise set of, a set of things that's easy to communicate and share, but, but a list that still captures the complexity of what we do. The fact that we have to do several things simultaneously. Simplicity is one thing, but there's also complexity in the message that I want to convey. This last point is really important. While the risk paradigm has dominated the dialogue, the policy dialogue around youth justice here and internationally for the last couple of decades, other themes have moved in and out of favour. Uh, for example, in the middle of the last decade, we saw the UK flirt with reorienting its system towards an educational model that reimagined uh, uh, secure facilities as secure schools and saw community-based facilities as training and skills hubs. About the same time, we saw several jurisdictions in the US and in Europe uh, refashion their system towards a treatment model that saw secure care reconceptualized as a therapeutic community and community services as aftercare hubs. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with either uh, approach, but I'd argue that the single strand thinking that underpins them is problematic. The young people who we work with are very complex and the system must address this complexity. It must do several things simultaneously. 
it must educate and build skills. It must heal, nurture and address past trauma. It must try to address and intervene in the underlying individual factors that are leading to offending behaviour, while also working on the systemic and structural context in which the young person finds themselves. And most importantly, it must do all of this in collaboration with family, community and culture. Our system must be designed to privilege several things simultaneously. Hence the need to articulate the many and varied pieces that make up the complex puzzle that is youth justice. Another thing that prompted me to distill, to just distill the key elements of our work was an urge to safeguard what we know to be true from fads, from misrepresentations, and even from simple misunderstandings. I've been around in youth justice for quite a while and I've seen the tendency for bureaucracies to develop a dominant language and a framework that indicates which ideas are in favour at a particular point in time and which are on the outer. And of course, this varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and it can change really quickly, uh, sometimes in response to a change in leadership or in response to a particular piece of policy work. In my own jurisdiction of Victoria, Australia, a recent review of the youth justice system included some commentary on the limitations of trauma-informed care as a means of reducing recidivism. Now, at the same time, the review acknowledged uh, the large proportion of people in youth justice who have experienced significant trauma, and it uh, acknowledged the role of trauma-informed care in delivering a holistic service to these people and also to providing an effective treatment milieu. What the review was really saying is that while trauma-informed care won't of itself reduce recidivism in the long term, it provides the platform and the preconditions for this important work to occur. Unfortunately, however, this nuanced message wasn't universally understood. Instead, a whole narrative emerged to the effect that YJ was abandoning its trauma lens, that trauma-informed care had somehow been relocated to the outer in youth justice. Around this time, a uh, CEO of a community-based organisation who was tendering for a major YJ project contacted me just to have a chat and see whether I thought their chances of tender success would be undermined if they referenced trauma-informed care in their submission. Around the same time, in an informal conversation, a senior ministerial advisor made an off-the-cuff remark that trauma theory was discredited in the context of youth justice. It was really disconcerting to see an important element of our practice so readily dismissed. It was just one small example of how a basic tenant of our practice can be vulnerable to shifts in thinking uh, or in this case even simple misunderstanding and it really reinforced the need to be express about why we do the things we do. Now, of course, every YJ system represented here today is different and context is vital. In some jurisdictions, there's an appetite for far reaching structural reform. In others, we're still passing laws, uh, endorsing mandatory sentencing and presumptions against bail. In some jurisdictions, youth justice sits in the adult portfolio along with adult corrections. In others, this would be totally inconceivable. In some jurisdictions, there's deep structural collaboration with culture in, and community. In others, we've got miles to go. I need to be up clear, clear upfront that um, most of my uh, experience is deeply embedded in the Australian context and in particular in the eastern states of Australia. While I've had the benefit of visiting New Zealand and uh, talking with practitioners and seeing services in operation, I've never worked in your jurisdiction and nor have I worked in remote Australia. Each of us brings our own context and experiences to the work we do and I apologise in advance if the things that I privilege are different to the ones that you privilege. 
And indeed, I'd welcome some discussion and feedback around this issue, around whether the propositions that I pose are transferable across jurisdictions, and indeed, whether this is even a worthwhile endeavour. I started off by saying that this presentation is about bringing the evidence to bear, and indeed it is. Each of the 10 things that every youth justice system must do is backed by a swag of evidence that I've documented elsewhere. But this raises a fundamental question. What constitutes the evidence in youth justice? After a couple of decades of the What Works movement, I find it helpful to distinguish between the traditional concept of evidence-based practice and the more inclusive concept of practice-based evidence. So traditional models of evidence-based practice rely on a hierarchy of evidence that place uh, the experimental design firmly at the top. However, there are lots of well-documented problems in applying this limited lens to youth justice, not the least of which are the costs uh, involved with it, but also the problems of controlling for structural and contextual factors that we know are so important uh, in justice system outcomes. For these reasons, it's important that we take a much more expansive view of the evidence in YJ and include the grey literature, literature that comes from service delivery organisations and from non-academic organisations. These often include good quality evaluations, but ones that generally fall short of that gold standard randomised control trial. If we don't draw on the grey literature, along with the peer reviewed research, we risk missing a whole lot of knowledge. First and most importantly, we miss user perspectives. A theme of this conference is weaving the voices of lived experience with best evidence. Taking this theme even further, the voices of lived experience are a form of best evidence. They're a legitimate part of the evidence base itself, central to our understanding of what an effective youth justice system must look like. Unfortunately, the voices of lived experience have been less influential in youth justice than they have in some other service systems. I suspect this is partly because we're talking about the voices of children and young people. And in our adult centric world, we always struggle to hear these voices at the best of times. But compounding this, of course, our young people have committed crimes. And like those in the adult criminal justice system, there's still a sense that wrongdoers somehow forfeit their right to participate and shape the processes that impact them. Nevertheless, change is afoot. Landmark research such as that undertaken by the Koori Task Force in Victoria that's led to the Our Youth, Our Way report that you'll hear a lot about tomorrow uh, has really gained a foothold in the evidence. Uh, and similarly, in New South Wales, the work of the Children's Advocate has been really important in bringing the voices of people involved in the youth justice system to the forefront. This is a really valuable counterbalance balance to the focus on individual risk factors and adverse childhood events that can simplify the real life experiences of young people and reduce our focus on structural factors that we know are so important. Now, I'm not discounting the value of the evidence base regarding risk factors. This has provided a rich understanding of the correlates between individual factors and offending that stood up over time and geography. I'm really just saying that we know so much more. Aside from lived experience, the grey literature can also tell us a lot about practitioner perspectives, about what it means to implement a project in the way it was intended, what the potholes are along the way and how to avoid them. It includes small samples that are crucial in understanding effective interventions for, for small cohorts in youth justice. And I'm thinking here of girls and young women in particular. Um, but the grey literature also includes terrific economic modelling, economic modelling of interventions that really have shifted the paradigm 
um, in persuading decision makers to work quite differently. And again, justice reinvestment comes to mind in this context. I'll start my slides now. Um, if you haven't already, it might be worth just making sure your screen's on full view setting. So then, the 10 things that every youth justice system must do draws on an expansive evidence base. And it's intended as a way of summarising what we know and helping it, us to explain it better to those who don't know. Now, spoiler alert, you all know these 10 things. You've been working uh, in them deeply for years. You've been practising them. You've heard and seen them. There's nothing new. However, I'm hoping that the presentation will prompt some reflection on which of these 10 things you may need to do differently or privilege more um, and will help you to explain your work again to those who don't understand it. I'm also thinking it might be helpful to provide a bit of an overarching framework that will anchor some of the specific ideas that you'll hear in the next three days. We're talking at a pretty uh, high systems level here. So I'm gonna take you through each of the the 10 things in turn. And just to make it interesting, I'm going to suggest one thing in each domain that I think will make a difference in for uh, to youth justice performance in that domain. Not necessarily the most important thing or the highest priority thing, but just one thing that I think is an interesting idea. Okay, let's dive in then. So the first thing that every youth justice system must do is treat young people differently to adults. Okay. So you might be thinking this is a bit of an underwhelming start, but it's not. While it may appear self-evident, this is one of the most fragile and corruptible tenets of youth justice and one that deserves constant reinforcement. It falls into that category of a truth that's so accepted and so agreed until it's not. Lots of commentators have noted the increasing adultification of youth justice. This can take many forms, including the pressure to uplift matters from youth courts to adult courts, a blurring of the distinction between the two jurisdictions, including making it easier to transfer young people from youth justice facilities to adult facilities, and the introduction of adult-focused practices within youth justice that deny some of the fundamental principles of adolescent development. On this last point, the COVID pandemic has really tested the commitment to a differential approach to young people in YJ in much the same way as it's tested our commitment to a whole range of principles and values that we hold dear in less challenging times. I've seen practices that apply in adult correctional settings like quarantining, isolation, lockdowns, limited runouts, extended into youth justice settings without question and without any sense of the need to modify these practices expressly and adapt them to take account of their unique impact on the developing adolescent brain. The application of adult-centric practices to youth justice settings in any context, let alone in the middle of a global pandemic and all the stresses that that brings with it, needs to be challenged at every opportunity. This goes to the culture of the youth justice setting and the need for express, clear and ongoing articulation of why young people need to be treated differently. Every worker in every YJ setting needs to be able to articulate in a few sentences why this is the case, why young people are different and what that means for the system. This rationale has to be heavily embedded in the brain science. It needs to reflect international human rights law, criminal jurisprudence, the different social context of young people that means they're reliant on adults for so much, the fact that their offending patterns are different and that their pathways into and out of the youth justice system are quite distinct. This statement must be at the very heart, the fabric of every youth justice system. At the bottom end, the evidence is really clear. Each year a young person's age at first sentence is delayed presents an 18% reduction in the likelihood of future offending. A really powerful statistic 
that bolsters the Raise the Age campaign. As I mentioned previously, I think it's inevitable that the age of criminal responsibility will be raised. And of course, that means bringing that age up to at least a minimum of 14 years. An age range, uh, a lower threshold of 12 is simply not acceptable. If that happens, we'll no longer see this sort of image. It's hard to know how you're all reacting out there without any feedback. Um, as an aside, the clever people who put my slides together are always providing me with funny cartoons and images, most of which I just can't possibly go with. This one did, however, um, make me smile, albeit in a bit of a sad way. But back to age differentials. It's not enough to apply the brain science to the lower end of the age spectrum. We need to look at the top end as well. Far from making it easier for young people to enter the criminal justice system at an adult level, the developmental science tells us that really youth justice should be extending its boundaries to accommodate some young adults who fall within the adult system in most jurisdictions. So for this domain, my one suggestion is to expand the upper age limit of youth justice. I was fortunate enough um, to meet uh, Judge John Walker, who, when he visited Melbourne a couple of years ago, and the approach that he was promoting in terms of the young adult space was really inspiring and one that I hope we can emulate in Australia. Indeed, most um, uh, adolescent-specific mental health and drug treatment services are designed to bridge the transition between adolescence and adulthood. They typically run sort of 18 to 24 year eight, years of age. Um, and youth justice should do the same. So possibilities for us include opening up the current youth justice sentencing options, both community-based and custodial, to a subset of young people currently in adult corrections. And there's good precedence for this sort of practice in many jurisdictions in the room. Uh, these options could be accessed via a specialist young adult court or at least a specialist list within the mainstream courts. We know that there's not a clear distinction between childhood and adulthood, so we need to aim for scaled, graduated approaches that vary with the young person's chronological age, uh, vary with their developmental age, not their chronological age. Just as future generations will look back in shame at the notion that we detained children as young as 10, so too will they regard our current treatment of young adults in the prison system that also ignores the developmental science. The second thing that every youth justice system must do is keep most people away from the system. Again, while this may seem self-evident, with remand populations at alarming levels in most jurisdictions in the room, it's clearly not being operationalised as intended. I won't elaborate here on the age crime curve and how most people will mature out of their offending behaviour if we can reroute them. This is why you all get up of a morning. The good news, of course, is that over the past decade, many jurisdictions have applied this knowledge introducing a range of diversionary measures that have effectively reduced the number of sentenced young people to their lowest level in years. But while we've made good, if uneven, progress in reducing sentenced populations, remand numbers have blown out across the board. Though the principle of diversion is widely accepted, it's not being operationalised in this space. We're used to thinking about diversion at a whole of jurisdiction level with formal system off ramps at every phase, uh, pre-charge, pre-court, pre-plea, pre-sentence. And of course, this system scaffolding is vital. All of those ramps are important. However, we need to supplement the system-wide scaffolding with a range of flexible place-based options that are developed in concert with local communities. To that end, we need data, especially data regarding early contact with the justice system, data about cautions, diversions, early conferencing, bail. Ideally, it would even be more granular and would include things like the use of stop and search powers that we know criminalise many young people. 
and most importantly, this data has to capture Indigenous status. As part of its gatekeeping efforts, youth justice needs to monitor front end activity with the police and the courts with a forensic focus. We need to call out regional disparities, geographic disparities in decision making that are too often ignored. So for this domain, my one key idea is to apply granular local data at the front end of the service system to develop place based responses. You know the story, what we count is what we care about. Data can drive changes to practices, especially in hierarchical organisations. When a rural senior sergeant is asked to explain to police command why the cautioning rates in his region are 40% lower than the statewide average and 20% lower than the region next door, practices can change. When a rural uh, supervising magistrate is asked to explain to the chief magistrate why their use of why they sentence uh, crossover children at four times the rate that crossover children are sentenced across the state, things can change. And if the practice doesn't change immediately in the courts and in police practices, it can be that this sort of data can provide a focus, a laser focus for where the community needs to step in and develop place based solutions. It might be an evening drop-in service, or it might be emergency accommodation, or access to after hours legal representation, or fast track um, advocacy of some kind. But whatever it is, it must be identified and owned by local communities from which our young people come. Too often the solutions come from afar with pools of funding that are uncoordinated and not invested in local hands that can actually make things happen or make the right things happen. The third thing that every youth justice system must do is privilege relationships. Again, newsflash, of course we must do this. Engaging young people in safe relationships is a primary task of every single youth justice practitioner. Yet, just a while ago, I was asked to review a high level policy document that had gone through several processes within uh, government and landed with a model that effectively changed a young person's worker as they moved from one type of community disposition to the next, as they moved between community and custody, and as they moved through various forms of supported bail. While this might work for us, it doesn't work for our clients. If there's one message that's come from every piece of lived experience research that I've ever conducted or reviewed, it's that young people value a single consistent worker, a positive adult in their lives who can help them manage and navigate the complexity around them. And so too do their families want that consistency. In my experience, the actual intervention in youth justice is often less important than a fundamental commitment to engaging in a safe, consistent way with the young person to build a relationship. With this in mind, youth justice systems must be designed to ensure continuity of workers as much as possible. Across custody and community, in the community across dispositions, and across pre-court work and post-court work, sustaining relationships must be a central tenant. When young, people, when young people look back on their time in youth justice, they always tell us it's the positive relationships that make a difference. So the ideal youth justice system should be designed to sustain the right worker. Young people should have some capacity to determine who that worker is and that so that person can stick with them over time as circumstances change. The next thing that every youth justice system must do is embed services deeply in family, culture and community. The theme of this conference is delivering youth justice in the community for the community. And there are many people who will speak to you in the next few days who are far more qualified than me to talk to this theme. The New Zealand justice system 
values culture and spirituality deeply and has much to teach us across the ditch about how to embed responses in family, culture and community. It's handed over the reins to iwi in a way that we can only dream of in Australia. Yet still every jurisdiction in this room uh, has First Nations people who are heavily overrepresented. Youth justice must engage with communities whose children are criminalised with Indigenous communities, with new and newly arrived migrant communities and with refugee communities. We must do this openly, with humility and with a commitment to learn and change our systems accordingly. The reality, of course, is that youth justice is a temporary interloper in the lives of young people. Most will remain embedded in their families and communities and we need to privilege these connections over time and bring families along with us on the journey. We also need to recognise that community is often better placed to deliver youth justice interventions than government. A while ago, I was uh, engaged to design a bail support program. I developed up all the specs, that, including the normal things that you would expect, including that the program be delivered by a network of local community organisations, including uh, Aboriginal controlled organisations. We know that agencies embedded in the community are really well placed to do this work. They deliver uh, weekend and after hours support seamlessly. They provide outreach organically. They often deliver other services like housing and employment. And if they don't, they know someone who does. And they generally have a higher tolerance of risk and potential breach activity. And most importantly, they're going to be there long after the young person's order has expired. Anyway, unfortunately, I didn't articulate any of this in the spec. I took it as a given. I assumed uh, acceptance of a principle that wasn't there. A few months later, I learned that the specs had been tweaked so that bail support could be delivered by government alongside its statutory functions. And I had to work really hard with others to turn things around. You know, yet another argument for taking the time to explain the things we do. Connecting with the community is also really vital in custody. It's about having a steady stream of community providers come in and out of the facility so that the walls around our custodial centres feel truly permeable. It's too often, it's too easy to default to the assumption that this pointy end work is best done by government. It's also about having those same custodial facilities supported by community based friends groups that made up of local businesses, local agencies, and of course, the local parliamentary member. There's a latent interest in youth justice that we don't always tap to the system's best advantage. Embedding community in the fabric of youth justice really reinforces the fact that our young people are of and from the community and have the same rights as everyone else. And also that the community in turn has an obligation to them. That's really important. The next thing we must do is partner with education. As we all know, 60% or thereabouts of young people in YJ have previously been excluded from school in some shape or form. Now, this stat is really compelling, but because we're used to it, we can forget its power for those not familiar with youth justice. It's just the sort of figure we need to build to, in, in promoting the case for partnership. And there's some great work going on in this space. Um, at the front end of the system, we see formal school retention programs. Um, we see whole of uh, school family engagement programs, parenting programs, restorative justice initiatives, and the delivery of after hours youth activity programs for at risk people within the school grounds. Uh, once young people hit the justice system, uh, other promising initiatives include locating education department staff within the court to navigate re-entry pathways and providing specialist school settings for justice involved young people, including step out uh, settings from custody. With good cross sector collaboration, these services can target postcodes that are overrepresented in YJ. So returning to that theme of granular data, my idea here is that we really need to partner with education to apply school exclusion data to get some local place-based initiatives moving forward. 
as we start thinking about the service frameworks that will emerge when the age of criminal responsibility is raised and youth justice exits the field, education should be front and centre in our thinking. Though there's a lot of talk about the role of uh, child protection here, and this is relevant for some young people, education is so well placed to identify at-risk children early and deliver localised place-based responses. Moving on, the next thing we must do, of course, in youth justice is address trauma and complexity therapeutically. As youth crime rates decline and diversionary initiatives do exactly what they're supposed to be doing, those young people who remain in youth justice, especially in custody, are likely more than ever to have multiple risk factors and have experienced serious trauma. I don't need to talk to you about the evidence in support of therapeutic interventions for these young people and the need to target these interventions at those most at risk. There'll be lots of conversations in this space over the next few days. There's just one key observation I wanna make here. As that small, very complex cohort of young people are responsible for a crowing proportion of youth crime, developing effective responses to young people who repeatedly breach community-based orders is a major challenge for YJ. When contemplating brief breach activity, youth justice must consider the impact of trauma, the impact of trauma on impulse control, on consequential thinking, on reward sensitivity. This means that our breach practices must, must be timely, they must be skills-based and flexible. They must aim to build the young person's insight into what's driving their behaviour, encourage them to take responsibility for it and develop the very skills that are missing, such as impulse control. Now, this doesn't mean that breach practices should be laissez-faire. It's vital that our approach is structured and swift and aims to address the causes of the breaching behaviour. And again, it must also engage family and community in this effort. Okay, moving right along. The next thing we must do, of course, is connect and connect with a range of different service systems. Because most of the drivers of offending by young people sit outside the remit of youth justice, so much of what we do relies on collaboration, on partnership, on influencing other agencies to do what's required. As you all know too well, children and young people are already left behind when they first hit YJ. And we really need to intervene back into those service systems. However, it can be really tough to get youth justice on the radar of other service systems, because the reality is that our clients comprise just a small proportion of their clients, even for services working at the so-called pointy end. In child protection, for example, while uh, about 50% of youth justice clients have had some past exposure to the child protection system. For child protection, it's a totally different story. For them, uh, justice involved young people only comprise about 7% of their clients. And the other 90% that they have to service also have multiple cross agency needs. If we look at the number of YJ clients in other systems that impact our work like education and mental health, the numbers are infinitely smaller. Getting our clients on their agenda is a real challenge. There's a huge and emerging literature on cross-sector collaboration that warrants a presentation of its own. I'll just simply add here a few strategies that I think are important. First of all, we must invest in discrete initiatives in mainstream agencies to deal with justice-involved people. Let's not try and make it everyone's business. So, for example, it's better to set up a specific role in child protection to oversee case management of crossover children rather than trying to get every child protection worker to do this work in, in a particular way. Second, it's good to get some justice related outcomes on the strategic plans and in the performance measures of other mainstream agencies. Returning to that earlier theme, what's measured matters. Third, we're relying a lot on multi-agency panels at the moment, and that's fantastic, but it's important to configure these panels in such a way that they have high-level sponsorship so that underperformance can re be remedied quickly. 
And finally, we need to negotiate priority access and workarounds for justice involved young people and get these embedded in formal protocols. That's my potted summary of the work in this space. We could talk about this all day. So we're getting there now. The next thing we have to do is invest in restorative approaches that uh, typically afford victims a role and include some form of reparation for harms caused. I need to be upfront and say that most of what I know about restorative practice, I've learned from New Zealand practitioners. What I love about these approaches is that they enliven so many of the other tenets of youth justice practice that I've canvassed today. When done well, they can engage culture, community and family in really meaningful partnerships to address the drivers and the impacts of offending. In this way, they're deeply relational. They go to the heart of that very human need for both reparation and forgiveness in the face of wrongdoing. And they're universally associated with positive satisfaction from all parties concerned. It's important that restorative approaches are embedded at all stages in the pipeline, not just upfront as a diversionary measure. They can be applied in novel ways to address conflict between young people in custody. They can be applied to ease the passage of a young person's return to community, particularly to small rural communities. Uh, and they have enormous potential uh, in situations where the young people is both a perpetrator and a victim of family violence. Uh, given the rate at which family violence intervention orders are breached by young people, this last idea has enormous diversionary potential. So I'll we'll focus on that. We need to establish specific family-based restorative practice initiatives in the family violence space for young people. A couple of years ago, I had the really interesting experience of working with a group of communications experts to discuss how we pitch youth justice in a way that makes sense to the general community. Now, these were people who knew nothing about YJ. They were experts in media and comms. They're the people that organisations bring in when things go terribly wrong to spin the communications. And yes, they did have some very interesting de-identified stories to share. But to my dismay, the first piece of advice they gave us in youth justice is don't refer to the evidence, even evidence about cost effectiveness of community-based responses to crime. One of the most emphatic messages to come from the group was that crime and punishment are deeply emotional topics which people and people make decisions with their hearts not their brains and not even with their hip pockets they urged us in yj to put a face to the issue by telling personal stories that demonstrate young people's capacity for growth and change and to talk about how victims are included in yj processes to build a sense of accountability and responsibility importantly they warned us against minimizing the seriousness of youth crime or providing excuses for young people's behaviour that relate to their background. But of real relevance here in the restorative space, there was furious agreement amongst all of the comms experts that out of everything we do in youth justice, restorative practice resonate, resonates the most deeply with the public and that this should be the primary focus of YJ's public story. I'll leave that section with that thought. The next thing we need to do is tailor responses to different cohorts. Uh, this is a high level version of the old responsivity principle and I won't labour this one too much. Suffice to say that the evidence is clear, age, gender, culture, cognitive ability, all have a huge impact on young people's pathways into and out of youth justice and our services must respond to this. Despite my career-long commitment to differentiated models for girls and young women, the only thing I want to highlight here is the urgent need to respond to the prevalence of cognitive disabilities, learning difficulties and language disorders among young people in YJ. We know we must screen for this and ensure that our practices are modified accordingly. This needs to occur across all of our services, but I'll just focus here on the courts. Again, the lived experience research tells us that all too often young people have no understanding of what's happening to them at critical times in their youth justice system interaction, particularly at stressful times, at court, at the police station, 
at entry to custody. We need to check constantly for comprehension, to repeat key messages, to use visual prompts, to rely on shorter, more frequent contacts and follow up with reminders and reinforcements. We need to enlist the support of other people in the young person's environment to help us with this. And this, of course, harks back to the themes of complexity and the need to make sure we design our systems in a way that young people can really meaningfully participate in. The final and most contentious perhaps thing that every youth justice system should do is provide safe and structured custodial environments. Naturally, I debated whether to include this in my list of 10, because like many of you, I'd prefer to envisage a youth justice system that didn't detain anyone in custody. Unfortunately, that's not the world in which we live. And pragmatically, I wanted to be clear that the one thing youth justice systems must do is keep young people safe and minimise harm. Everything else is icing on the cake. Unless we can guarantee a safe, stable and secure environment, nothing else good can happen. If we get this right, education, training, therapeutic interventions can all follow. Again, we know what we need to do. While good physical design plays a role, safety is maximised when young people have good relationships with staff, when they have a full structured day that extends to weekends and evenings, and when they have consistent behavioural management incentives. Returning to where we all started, this work relies on a skilled trained workforce with a commitment to good relational work. Perhaps more than any other area of youth justice practice, uh, effective custodial work is deeply relational. It's vital that a commitment to building strong relationships is recognised expressly in custodial practices right through from intake to discharge. I'm not saying that relationships have to be the primary consideration, but they need to feature expressly in the range of figures that it can, uh, the range of features that are considered. Okay, so there we have it. The 10 things that every youth justice system must do. Each is backed by a swag of evidence. Each should feature when you're explaining to decision makers why we do the things we do in youth justice. And each should be front of mind when you're designing new initiatives and assessing your performance as a system overall. Thank you. Uh, a, a surgical uh, walk through those 10 key issues. And uh, I think even though you said at the beginning, a lot of us will recognize some of those things. It was a very sharp, accurate, precise reminder of those things. So uh, I know there's a lot of uh, comments about the, the the thought provoking where you presented those things. A couple of questions that people asked and um, when anonymous person said that uh, your your comments particularly about the way policy is developed and the way that government can um, lurch from policy to policy, uh, would you have been able to say things as freely and frankly had you still been employed in government than being uh, an external advisor and any advice for those of us who are in government about how to be equally fearless and frank? Um, the short answer is no, Phil. Um, <laughs> uh, there is a, a freedom that comes from being outside of government. Um, notwithstanding, though, I, I think um, there's a, a way that there's an interface between uh, the bureaucrats and external experts and academics. And often um, there can be a dialogue between the two that really creates quite a healthy tension, I think, for the system overall, where um, you know, sometimes bureaucrats may be feeling hamstrung by sort of the, the dominant paradigm that they're working within and may rely on external people to actually um, do some of the agitation be advocates for change in a, in a different way. So I think that's a, an interesting um, perspective. Certainly, uh, you know, bureau bureaucracies that draw on standing groups of external experts um, of academics bring the research to bear, I think, are stronger 
for that process. And I think that creates a healthy tension again, where we can challenge some of the, the, the dominant paradigms if they're unhelpful. Thank you. Assuming that um, within a short space of time, we will see the minimum age of criminal responsibility rise. And I think we're all um, desperately hoping that we can get it to 14 uh, in our generation's experience. Would you see an opportunity then to raise the, the upper age range? And where would you see that upper age range, given what we know now about brain development? If we have a, a, a separate distinct youth jurisdiction, what do you think that age should be? Um, I, I suspect the most sensible approach is to have some overlapping of the jurisdictions um, because we do see a huge range of maturation levels within that young adulthood space. So I'd, I'd like to see an overlapping range, you know, where the, the youth justice system potentially, you know, pulls back up to as high as 24, um, with the adult jurisdiction kicking in earlier than that. Um, and I, I think our response to young adults has to be quite sophisticated. Part of it is youth justice doing more in that space, but the other part is the adult correctional system delivering uh, young adult dedicated responses as well. So I'd like to see a suite of initiatives um, that really pick up on this issue because we're, we're lagging desperately on the, on the brain science there. Um, I think that, you know, 24, 25 is highly defensible in terms of the brain science. Thanks, Lisa. I, it's a question that comes from a very particular Aturon New Zealand context. We are in the process of trying to become more whanau-centric, more holistic in, in our approach to delivering children's services. And part of that is to um, provide the kind of continuity of the trusted uh, relationship with the primary social worker or primary staff member engaging with the family um, and provide that continuity and provide that service. You, you call that out as an, as an important thing from a, a young person's perspective, um, but as you walked through the 10 things that we should do, there was a clear underpinning philosophy that you have people who understand youth justice, are specialists in youth justice and understand how to work in that context. How, how would you construct a children's service that provide that continuity of care, but also provided for the specialist youth justice worker to step in and do their particular job? I, I think one of the things that, I mean, it's, it's the $6 million question in, in a way, but I, I think we need to think, um, take a client child centred approach to this and look at who is in the young person's orbit at a point in time, who is skilled, who understands adolescent development, who under, still has a relationship with that young person and think more flexibly about how we can utilise those skills. So for instance, um, we, we case conference in many jurisdictions at the moment in quite a simplistic way where the youth justice worker tries to bring people in to share information, but we don't actually hand over any of the supervisory functions or the statutory role. I think there's a scope to do that differently to really in the future conceptualise role boundaries much more differently and contract people in and out to undertake those functions. And it, it's a bit of a radical idea, but I think that's where we'll head if we want to deliver truly continuous services to young people. Does that make sense, Phil? It does absolutely make sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that comes to the end of the questions. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. So I, 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 I'd like to thank you, uh, Lisa, for uh, the, the, the takeaways. And I'm sure that um, had had we been able to, to meet in person, a lot of people would be seeking you out in the bar this evening and following up these conversations. So I hope that there's a virtual way that people seek you out and do that. It's been very, uh, very great session. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Phil. Thanks, everyone.